Well, we're looking at a series called Financial Stress to Financial Peace. We, our theme verse or theme passage is Matthew chapter 6, 31 to 33. You have these in your notes. Don't ever worry and say, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? Everyone is concerned about these things, and your heavenly Father certainly knows you need all of them. He knows. He knows. Okay. But first, be concerned about his kingdom. What um, has his approval? The things that he is into, we need to get into. And then all these other things will be provided for you. As I said, our series is called From Financial Stress to Financial Peace. And what God wants to do is exchange the stress that you have concerning finances with his peace. Because he doesn't want you to worry about these things. Actually, he's promised that if we would focus on what concerns him, he would look after our concerns. And in the series so far, we've looked at how do I find financial peace. We've given you an overview. Thank you, Sarah. An overview of how to find financial peace. We looked at how do we overcome the desire for more because that's one of the things that's keeping us from getting free financially is is the need for more. So we looked at the whole thing of materialism and a four-step plan to overcome materialism. We also looked last week at how to go to debt. God doesn't want us to be in debt. We looked at a nine-step plan to follow to get out of debt. And as I said, you can go to the website, click on the link where it says assignments, and there's a whole uh, uh, web page full of links you can go to to watch videos, to download free uh, um, spreadsheets, budgeting sheets, uh, little blogs to read with really good material. Especially this week, you're going to find some excellent material because today's topic is how do I save in this economy. And you're going to find lots of good tips on how to save money. You're going to find lots of good tips on how to make more money on the side. And you're going to find lots of tips on how to, as, like as you're, as you're going out during the day to buy things, you're going to be able to save money that way. But also you're going to be able to put money in the bank. And there's, there's I think I, I think he gave you seven links, seven or eight links on how to actually do all those things. And... It was interesting. There was, there was a survey done in, in New York City. I was trying to find something more Canadian. I'm trying to use Canadian statistics as much as possible. But there was a survey done in 2008 in New York City, and it said, are you satisfied with your finances? And only 26% of people were actually satisfied with their finances. 74% says, no, we're not satisfied at all. So of the 26% that were satisfied, they say, you know what, I'm, I'm really, really satisfied with my finances. They, there was four uh, common uh, traits of the people that found themselves really satisfied with their finances. Number one, they were free of consumer debt, right? They maybe had a mortgage, but they were free of consumer debt, okay? The things you buy that depreciate. Uh, they had a reserve of at least six months or more of salary in the bank. So if there was a crisis, if there was a layoff from work, they could say, you know what, I can survive for six months without, without having to be concerned at all. Okay? Number three, they were living on less than they made. Right? They were living on less than they made. And number four, they had an investment plan for the future. Interesting. See, financials are a major issue. And the reason finances are really a major issue, you know, and I keep going back to the quote by Zig Ziglar. He says, finances are not everything. Money's not everything, but it's kind of right up there with air. You know, it's a big deal. We use finance, we use money to pay our bills, right? And, and, and so finances are a big deal. One of the reasons they're a really big deal because they're, they're an issue of the heart. Finances really are an issue of the heart. Um, the number one cause of divorce is still financial issues. In fact, the United States in 2008, 54% of marriages that ended in divorce uh, gave the reason as being financial issues, money issues. In fact, uh, April 6, 2008 issue of, issue of Press Release Log, which is a log you can actually sign up for, uh, daily press rele- the top press, press releases, April 6, 2008, said that specifically credit card debt was cited as the number one reason for marriage breakdowns. Not regular debt, because sometimes stuff just happens, right? Sometimes it's an emergency and you have to go to the hospital. Sometimes it's an emergency and you got to get those teeth fixed. But it was, you know, things just sometimes happen. But they said the number one issue that was behind marriage breakdown was ongoing credit card debt. Okay. So no, I guess it's no longer till death do us part, is it? It's till death do us part. (laughs) (laughs) Scary, isn't it? And why is that? Because money 
really is a heart issue. Money is tied to our heart. And in fact, the Bible, the Bible says that God uses money to test us. So he does what? God uses money to test us. He uses finances to test the condition of our heart and the condition of our faith. Luke chapter 16, verse 11. Here's the verse. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who's, who will trust you with true riches? God is saying that he watches how we manage worldly wealth. If we can't handle worldly wealth, God can't trust us with true riches. Well, what is worldly wealth? Obviously, it's finances, money, you know, the material aspects of money, material possessions. And God says that if you're not a good money manager with something as simple as money, then how can he trust us to manage other more important things? Wow. So money is a test. Money is a test. Money is an indicator of our heart, our motives, and our abilities. In other words, the amount that God is able to bless my life is dependent on my ability to manage this material thing called money. And so if I've been able to manage my finances well, God will give me uh, the opportunity to manage uh, even more important things, things that are, that are of greater significance, like healthy relationships, godly influence on the next generation, leaving a legacy, the things that really matter, leading people into, into, into things. God can't trust us with those things of great significance if we don't even know how to handle our finances. Money and our heart are connected because money reveals our heart. Um, you know, see, no one, I can, no one can tell what your heart really like. We can assume, we can guess, but we don't really know what our heart, what a person's heart is really like. Uh, but mismanagement of money can be an indicator of a mismanagement of a life. Where there's unhealthiness in the money management, there could be unhealthiness in other aspects of your life. In fact, Jesus said it this way. He said in Luke chapter 12, verse 34, your heart will always be where your treasure is. Your heart will always be where your treasure is, meaning what you treasure, that's where your heart will go. What you put value on will be where you spend the focus of your heart. Said another way, your heart's priority will reflect what your true uh, treasure is. The quality of your heart will determine the quality of what you truly treasure. They're tied together. It's like I remember go working at uh, Stelco in Hamilton in the engineering department, mechanical maintenance engineering department, and all these other guys in there, they had pictures of their, their wife, and if, if they had them, their children on their desk. Every desk, wife and kids, wife and kids, wife and kids. And then there's this one guy, his, his uh, Jag was there. Actually, no, it was his Porsche. His Porsche. No, no wife and kids, just the Porsche. That's <laughs> what he treasured. He treasured his Porsche more than his family. Right? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Today I want to look at five principles of uh, financial stability. Some of you are still back wondering what's on your husband's desk at work, I can tell. <laughs> Go visit him. Take him a coffee. Surprise, what's on your desk? Okay. <laughs> there are five principles of financial stability. And the middle principle is saving. We're going to talk about savings, but there are actually five principles you've got to do together if you're going to save. So the middle principle is called saving, but there are two principles before saving that empower you to be able to save, and there are two principles after saving that um, sustain your ability to save, okay? So two principles to empower saving, then there's saving, then there's two principles to sustain your, the, your saving, okay? So, in other words, if we only talk about saving today, you're not going to get very far. We need to look at the principles that help you to start to save. We need to look at the principles that help you to continue to save, okay? And the neat thing is that these five principles come from the richest man who ever lived. Who, interesting enough, was the wisest man who ever lived. We're getting it, okay. His name was Solomon. King Solomon, and he wrote the book of Proverbs, and he wrote, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, remember, he wasn't just the wisest man who ever lived. 
He was the richest man who ever lived. So it sounds like there's something connected between wisdom and, and finances. And if he was that wise, then he's probably worth listening to. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to listen to Solomon. And fortunately for us, Solomon wrote down his wisdom in two books. Okay, uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So I'm going to look at five principles from, from uh, Proverbs. Okay, So these are five principles of financial stability. Okay, five principles of financial stability. And the first principle is keep good records. Right? Just, just keep good records. And this is called the principle of accounting. The principle of accounting is basically keeping good records. See, part of, part of saving is, is understanding where you're at financially. Just, just you, see, you can't save if you don't have an accurate picture of your finances, of your financial state. You see, you have to know how much debt you have and how much income you have, and how much savings you have, or said another way, you have to keep good records so you know how much, how, you, know how much you need to save and how much you can, uh, you do have the ability to save. Okay? You can't just say, oh, I'm going to start to save $500 a month. No, you have to look at your finances and see if that's even possible. Okay? So Solomon said this, and, and actually that, that doing that, just figuring out how much debt you have, how much income you have, how much you, savings you could put away, how much you need to put away, that's called the principle of accounting. Proverbs chapter 27, verses 23 and 24. Richer, riches can disappear fast, so watch your business interests closely. Watch your business interests closely. And he goes on to say, know the state of your flocks. Now, now Solomon wrote the, these words in 950 B.C. approximately when it was an agricultural society, right? And everybody either had fields of grains or sheep, goats, whatever. Okay? If Solomon were to write that today, he wouldn't say, watch, you know, know the condition of your flocks. He'd say, know the condition of your stocks, right? Your bonds, your... Your, your investments, right? Now, a lot of people say, gee, I, I just don't know where all the money goes. Well, to me, that's an indicator that there's a problem. Right? You should be knowing where your money's going. It's your money. You should know where it's going. If you don't know where it's going, to me, that's a warning light. Right? Someone says, you know, like money talks. Well, money doesn't talk. It just sneaks away quietly. It really does. And you have to watch it closely if you're going to know what's going on with your finances. So I love the Living Bible version, although it's a little bit irreverent. It says this in Proverbs 18, verse 13. How stupid to decide before knowing the facts. In our house, that, that's a dirty word, okay, the word stupid. But it's in the Bible, <laughs> How, how stupid to decide before knowing the facts. Proverbs 23, 23, get the facts at any price, right? Understand, have a clear understanding of what's really going on. What are the facts you need to know? If you're going to save money, what are the facts you need to know? You need to know four main facts. Number one, how much do I owe? I'm sorry, how much, how much do I own, okay? How much do I presently own? Remembering that your net worth is not tied to your self-worth, right? It doesn't really matter in one sense how much you own because the people with the greater wealth doesn't mean they have greater self-worth and you don't reflect what you own onto your self-worth. But you do need to know how much you own. Number two, how much do I owe to other people? What are my debts? What are my liabilities? Number three, how much do I earn? See, most people don't even know this. They really don't know how much they earn. If you go to the average person and you say, well, how much do you earn? Well, I make $12 an hour. No, you don't. You don't. You make $12 an hour minus deductions and taxes and all that stuff. So if you're making $12 an hour, you're, if you bring home $9 an hour or $9.50, you're doing good. You don't really make $12 an hour. See, most people don't even know how much they really earn. Well, I make this much a year. No, you don't. I, may, I, you know, I make $60,000 a year. No, you don't. If you're bringing home forty-five or fifty, you're doing really good because there's a lot of deductions. You don't know. You need to know how much you, you earn. And number four, you need to know how much you spend. You really need to know how much you're spending. 
a lot of people don't know how much they're spending. The good news now is that it's a lot easier today than 50 years ago to, to, to keep track of that. Right? 50 years ago, you had massive books and ledgers. Today, there's even free software you can download. There's online programs. Uh, I've referred to on the website, you can talk about, there's free programs you can use that you can download or go online to use and type in all that stuff. They keep track of everything for you, okay? They even are tied to your bank, so you can actually download from your bank your, your running totals into the software. It's great. There's some really good stuff out there. Uh, money, Quicken, all sorts of programs, okay? Um, now, you may be one of those people that are saying, you know what, I know I need to do that, but I really don't have time. Like, I am so busy, I've got so much to do, I have to worry about budgeting this, I have to worry about paying that bill, I have to worry about uh, making sure my kids get food on the table every night, I have to worry about this and that. Well, here's my solution. All you have to do is take some of that time that you spend worrying <laughs> and invest that time into keeping track of your finances. It doesn't take that long, that long if you keep on top of it. Now, if you only do it once a month, it takes a lot of time. But if you can keep up with it every few days or, you know, and you put in little boxes and stuff, there, there's ways to do it anyway, okay? See, one of the greatest antidotes to worry is just knowing the truth. Because so much of what we worry about doesn't ever happen. So if you want to deal with worry, you just know the truth. And that's why we already read it in Proverbs. Riches can disappear fast, so watch your business interests closely. Watch your business interests closely. So that's the principle of accounting. The number one principle, if you're going to start to save money, you've got to see where you're at. You've got to learn about accounting. You've got to you know, keep track of what your expenses and get a really good handle on where things are right now. If you're going to save, you've got to understand that. The second principle is now to plan my spending. Plan my spending. And that's the wonderful principle that nobody likes to do. It's called budgeting. The principle of budgeting is I, I plan my spending. Now, because that's a dirty word to most households, I've given you a different word. And, and the wonderful new phrase is financial goal setting. Doesn't that sound nicer? Financial goal setting. Because that's what budgeting is. A budget is setting goals so that you can decide where your money goes. That's all budgeting is. Financial goal setting. Setting goals so that you can determine where your money goes. You know, this is how much I'm going to spend on food. This is how much I'm going to spend on entertainment, rent, mortgage, whatever, um, savings, uh, things like that. You decide in advance how much is going to those different departments. And you make sure it's, and you say no after that money's been spent. So, so right now, you need to make a decision that you're not going to go through this next year like you did this last year. Right? We have to make decisions. We, and, and so if you're in a bad financial situation right now, let that be a wake-up call. Right? Just let it be a wake-up call. You know, like, wake up. Like, it's time. It is time. You know, folks, as I said last week, it is not time to, to be sloppy with your finances anymore. There's too much stuff going on in the world economics today, world economy right now. It's not time because you could get really sideswiped if you don't get your house in order now, okay? With the, with the, with the economic crisis in Japan, what are they talking? Two, what, $300 billion to rebuild the infrastructure. Where is that money going to come from? Well... They just happen to be the second largest holder of U.S. dollars in the world. Yeah, they sell off U.S. dollars to generate fund. So what happens to the American dollars? What happens to the Canadian dollar? Interest. Anyway, so it's time. It's time. Proverbs 2, 21, verse 5. Plan carefully and you will have plenty. Plan carefully and you will have plenty. If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. What is acting too quickly? That's called impulse buying. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. If we act too quickly, you will never have enough. Impulse buying. Planning carefully, that's about budgeting. That's about setting proper financial goals so that you won't give in to impulse buying. You ever been on your way to a restaurant and you, you say, you know what? I'm just going to go get a salad. It's really good for me. It's healthy. And I can probably get a salad at a local cafeteria for maybe, what, four or five bucks. 
So you're on your way out of the office and you're going towards that, that place that has a salad and all of a sudden you hear your name. <laughs> Dave, or whatever your name is. And you look, who's calling you? It's the burger place across the street. <laughs> it knows your name. It knows your name. And you're drawn over there and you think, you know what? Maybe I really would like a burger. So you go in and you, I'm just going to get a burger and I'll get the healthy one. <laughs> but all of a sudden they say, you can save money if you get the trio. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's the next price. And then after you finally give in to the trio, then they say, and would you like to supersize that? <laughs> and you were ready to spend four or five dollars and get something healthy. Instead, you're toxifying your body, but it's co and it's costing you ten dollars. You doubled your expense. You just gave in to impulse buying. <laughs> this verse says, if we play, if we act too quickly, we will never have enough. Okay, but this verse also says that if we plan carefully, we will have plenty. See, financial freedom is not based on how much we earn. Financial freedom is based upon how much we spend. And the key to getting your spending under control is called planning. We plan how much we're going to spend before we spend it. Some people budget by just keeping track of how much they've spent. That's not true budgeting. It's called just making a bad news record. It's like a horror novel, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Many people think, if I just made more money, I'd be financially free. And we know that's not the case. Because most of you are making a lot more money today than you did five years ago. But that doesn't mean your finances are in better shape. So what's the key? The key is careful planning. Okay. And you know, and this verse does says God wants us to have plenty. He wants us to have enough. He doesn't ask us to take a vow of poverty. He doesn't. There's nothing wrong with Christians having finances. The Bible says you will have enough. You will have plenty. There's nothing wrong with saving for the future. And budgeting is part of saving. Now, Here's God's God. Did you know that God has a financial IQ test? You ever taken an IQ test growing up? Yeah, taken a number of them. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right. I'm going to pass one of these days. <laughs> Here's God's financial IQ test. Proverbs 21, verse 20. Stupid people spend their money as fast as they get it. So, are you passing God's IQ test? <laughs> How intelligent are you? Are you holding on to your money, or is money doing what, you know, that phrase, uh, burning a hole in your pocket? God says that if you spend your money as fast as you make it, that's called stupidity. God's not against saving. He's against foolish spending. And so we need to break off those foolish habits that we've somehow got into our life. And the tool that we use to break off those disastrous spending habits is called budgeting, financial planning, financial goal setting. Okay. Okay. First principle, as I said, the first principle is to see where your finances are at. It's taking a, an evaluation of where your finances are really at. It's called the principle of accounting, keeping good records. And it's really important because you have to know where you financially are because you need to know how much you can save and how much you need to save. And then number two, the principle of budgeting or financial goal spending is we plan our spending. Because if you're not telling your money where to go, then you're not going to be able to t tell it, some of it to stay with you and be saved, right? To save your money, okay? You're not going to be able to save your, any of your money if you, if you won't tell it where to go. 
So the third, the third principle, remember I said two principles to get us ready to save for money? The first is accounting, the second is budgeting, now the third principle is saving. Okay? But it's saving for the future. It's not saving for tomorrow. It's saving for a, at least a few weeks from now or longer. Okay? And that's called the principle of saving is saving for the future. And, and see, Proverbs 21 verse 20 says, The wise man saves for the future. So again, the Bible is not against you having a savings account. The wise man saves for the future. So are you saving the future? God wants us to save for the future. See, God has no trouble with you buying the stuff you need. And he even doesn't have to have trouble with buying some of the stuff you don't need that you only want. He's not a party pooper. You know, it's like he wants us to enjoy the things that in, of this life. But he only wants you to buy that stuff if you have the money. <laughs> see, here's the problem with the North American culture. We see something we want, okay? Big screen TV, plasma screen, high def, the whole bit, right? Um, whatever, 40 inch, 60 inch, I don't know what, what the big thing is right now. But what we tend to do is we buy, then we try to pay little by little, and then we pray and hope that we can make ends meet. <laughs> so we buy, pay, pray. God's formula is to pray, save, buy. See, you knew this. <laughs> you, 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 you look at the item and you say, God, is it okay if I have this? You pray about it. And then if God says yes, then you save little by little until... You get the money, and then you pay for it. And like I said, a lot of times God's going to say, yeah, look, you're in good financial shape. The money's coming in. Just all you have to do is you know, be, have some self-control for a month. And you'll have that money there. Then you can go and get it. See, and, and God wants you to enjoy these things. And a lot of times he wants you to buy them so you can bless other people with them. As, a friend of, uh, as I said, a friend of mine uh, in London, Harvey, my friend Harvey, bought one of the first 60-inch plasma screen TVs in, in London, Ontario. He, had, he was one of the first. Now, he's making like $200,000 a year. But anyway, but he, he got one of these things. But you know what he does with it? He opens his house up every week, and he runs an alpha ministry, which is a Christian discipleship ministry. And he has 24 to 30 people in his in his uh, living room three times a year, like three series of 13 lessons a year, and he's, he sees at least 40 people a year saved and filled with the Spirit in his living room watching on his big plasma screen TV. It's okay to buy these things, but you have to ask God because God will, deter, will, will know your heart, and he'll know if you're going to use that thing as an idol or to glorify him. Okay. <clears throat> so the wise person prays. God, is it okay? Yes, it is. Okay. And you start putting money away, $30 a week or $50 a paycheck or whatever, until you have the money, then you buy it. No stress, no worry. Let me give you three practical examples on how to save some money, okay? Just save on your expenses. Number one, it, it, <laughs> well, let me read your verse first. Proverbs thirteen eleven: Money that comes easily disappears quickly. Money that comes easily disappears quickly, but money that is gathered little by little grows. Little by little, you, you save money little by little, and suddenly, you know, I have this little thing at home. It's just a, this little house the Canadian Bible Society gave me. It's a little tiny house about this big, and all I do is I just throw my, my pennies and my nickels and dimes, unless it tends to end up with my quarters for some reason, but my pennies and nickels and dimes go in that box. Why well, am I able to send a nice, sizable check to the Canadian Bible Society four times a year to help to pay for Bibles for other countries. Just on nickels. See, money grows little by little. Little by little, it adds up. Okay, here's an example. Some of you, many of you, like Starbucks coffee. We've already used this example, so I'm going after it again. Okay? <laughs> and a lot of you so much love your Starbucks coffee that you make sure you have at least one Starbucks today because you love your Starbucks coffee, okay? Now, depending on, if you, unless you have the really simple, basic variety, you're probably going to be spending between four and five bucks for that Starbucks coffee. So say four fifty, okay? Okay, yeah, four fifty-seven. Okay, there you go. 
I always have this expert witness with me, right? Okay. Now, if all you do is you give up one Starbucks coffee a day, one coffee, one Starbucks coffee a day, by the end of the year, you will have saved, ready for this, $1,642. $1,600. What's that, three plasma screen TVs? I don't know. <laughs> Buy one for you and the neighbor. You know, it's like, win them to the Lord by giving away plasma screen TVs. <laughs> I got, <laughs> yeah, that's right. $1,642. Now, now, but you still need a coffee, right? So what you do is you buy a bag of ground coffee and you make your own. You know how much it costs to make your own coffee? Between 10 and 25 cents a cup. Between 10 and 20. Say 25 cents. You know what that's going to cost a year? $92. $92 at 25 cents a cup if you have one a day. Okay, so $1,642 or $91. You can save just by making your own coffee rather than, than buying a Starbucks one a day. You can save $1,552. Folks, for some people, that, that's, that's a vacation for two these days. That's a week's vacation for two to celebrate your... your your, 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 your what, you know, marriage, your anniversary. That's what I was looking for, anniversary. When, again, when I was at Stoco back in Hamilton, I looked around. I, see, I'm a little bit of an entrepreneur, and I looked around. I saw all these guys coming in with all these coffees. And so what I did is I got this beat-up 30-cup coffee thing from home, and I made coffee in the morning because I thought, you know, just for a couple of my friends. And suddenly, there's a lineup every morning. So we used the profit, and we only charged 25 cents a cup. We bought a 100-cup coffee maker. From the profit, we bought a timer, so we actually made it the night before, and it came on in the morning. So at uh, quarter to eight in the morning, it was ready, and the guys were lining up. We had to fill that thing up at noon. So that's 200 cups a day selling to the guys in my department. Twice a year at Christmas... And in June, we took my whole department out to a party, banquet, steak, the whole bit for free, just on the profits of making our own coffee. <laughs> yeah, no. Twice a year, we spent over $1,000 taking everybody out for supper because... We were selling coffee at 25 cents a cup, 200 cups a day. You can save $1,500 a year if you give up one Starbucks coffee a day. Wow. Second example, investments. Over the last 70 years, over the la like, okay, the last 70 years, the, the stock market has made 12%. It's averaged 12% over the last 70 years. It's averaged 12%, okay? So if you are 25 years old and you decide to put $75 a month, where am I getting that $75 a month? You can save $140 a month by not drinking that coffee. You have the money. You put $75 a month into a, a balanced uh, stock portfolio. And that $75 a month, if you do it starting when you're 25 until 70, say you retire at 70, you will have in the bank $1.3 million dollars by taking your coffee money and putting it into stocks instead. 1.3 million. That's still a big number to me. Maybe it's not to you, but it's still a big number to me. Hey. Money that comes easily disappears quickly, but money that is gathered little by little grows. I love this quote by Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, the most famous scientist of this generation, said this, the most powerful force in the world is not the atom. The most powerful force in the world is compound interest. So says Albert Einstein. I'd listen to him. He's a smart guy. A third quick example. How do you save money? Practical quick example. About six years ago, we were talking to another family, and they were in a really serious financial situation. They were not able to pay their mortgage. It was getting really, really bad. And they, and they shared with us that they were spending $800 a month 
to feed their family of four. $800 a month to feed their... See, you can say, wow, but I bet you don't know how much you're spending. I bet you really don't know how much you're spending. $800 a month to feed a family of four. We were spending $400 a month, spending $400 a month to feed a family of six. A lot different. Do you know what we found out? They were buying their supper on their way home from work every night. So they go to the store on the way home. So what happens? You buy smaller quantities, and so you don't have leftovers because you buy fresh stuff every night, right? Whereas we were buying once a week, so you buy larger quantities, right? You buy them on Monday because that's a sale day, right? And you buy all this stuff, and you can, you, can, you can cut your food bill in more than half if you buy weekly instead of daily. But you know what that means? You've got to plan your meals for the week. So we're back to budgeting. We're planning. We're talking now about meal planning. If all you do is you start planning your meals and you buy your, your groceries once a week instead of daily, you can um, reduce your expenses by 50%. Guaranteed. Okay. Quick. Okay. So that's the principle of saving. God wants us to save. Number four, the fourth principle is called returning 10% to God. Remember what we've done. We've got two principles that help us to save. We talk about saving. Now we need to look at two principles that's going to sustain our savings. Two principles to sustain our savings. And one of them is called the principle of tithing. The principle of tithing. Well, how on earth is that going to save money by tithing? Well, I'll explain that. But first, we need to think about... See, when we talk about goal setting, we need to talk about three types of, of goals, okay? There's three types of goals we should set. Number one, savings goals. How much should I save? And what should I save for? Should I save like $75 a month? Should I save $200 a month? Should I save $2,000 a year? What do I need? Like, what are my savings goals? And you take that money and you make it untouchable. Because if it can be touched, it can be grabbed. And if it can be grabbed, it can be carried. And if it can be carried, it can be spent. Right? So you make it untouchable. So number one, savings goals. Number two, spending goals. How much money will I spend? I budget and I tell my money where it's going to go. How much to rent, how much to food, how much to entertainment, how much to whatever. Okay, you, you have spending goals. And then number three, I have giving goals. How much do I give to my church? How do I, much do I give to my favorite charities? How much they give to special needs. Okay. And I, I have, personally, I have giving goals uh, for things in my life, but I also have giving goals in terms of the leader, as, as the leader of this church. We, we together as elders have giving goals for how many backpacks we're planning to give away this year to uh, needy kids. We have giving goals on how many snowsuits we're going to give away, how many Christmas turkeys we're going to give away, how many Easter hams we're going to give away, food and clothing and emergency money for crisis needs. We have giving goals. See, and to me, giving goals are the most fun. It, you know, giving goals really are the most fun because a generous life is a life that's worth living. It's a fun life. It's an exciting life. And as Jesus said, it's a lot more blessed to give than to receive, because the blessing is on the giving, not on the receiving. So sometimes if I receive something, I'll try to give it away quickly again, because I want the blessing on it. Okay. And part of giving relates to the principle of tithing. Now, what is tithing? Again, there's so many misconceptions about tithing, and we could spend hours and hours and hours, but instead I'm just going to give a really quick summary on tithing, because we already talked about it a bit. Okay, today here's a quick overview, and hopefully it's going to clear up some mis misconceptions. Number one, tithing is simply giving the first 10% of what you earn and returning it to God. Okay, returning it. I'm using that word return for a reason, because God gave me that money in the first place. So all I'm doing is returning 10% of it back to God. It's not that I made this money and it's mine and God gets 10% as a tax. No, this is God's money that he gave to me to manage, to steward, and I'm returning 10% of it back to God. Um, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10a, bring to the storehouse a full tenth of what you earn. A full tenth. A ten means 10%. A tenth means 10%. So the tithe is the first 10%. And the full tithe means it's the whole tithe. It's 10% of your gross, not your net. Now, why did God say, God say 10%? I don't know. I really don't know. You know, he didn't say 50%. 
He didn't say 5%. He said 10%. And so something in God's wisdom said 10% is sufficient. Because money is a test, right? 10% is sufficient to do the job that I need that money to do. Okay? So it's enough. Perhaps it's enough to prove that we really are honoring God with our finance. Maybe 10% is enough to prove that we really do trust him first with our finances, that he is first in the area of our, financial, uh, um, our, fi our finances in our lives. And, and, and really when you think about it, when we tithe, every time we tithe, we are making a statement and we're honoring God concerning our past, our present, and our future. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. For my past, when I give the tithe back to God, when I return to him the tithe, his tithe, it's a statement of gratitude. I'm saying, thank you, God, that you gave me the breath, the ability, the wisdom, the mental functioning, the skill, whatever. You gave these things to me so that I could earn this money. Therefore, when I tithe, I'm saying, thank you, God. I'm thinking of my past. He gave it all to me, so I'm returning back to him. I'm thanking him as a statement of gratitude for what he's done, what he's given me in the past. Number two, when I tithe, it's a statement of priority. I'm saying, God, when I tithe now, I'm, I'm showing you that you're number one in my life now. I'm not only thanking you for what you've done in my life in the past, but I'm saying, God, you're still number one. You're still number one in my finances. You're my priority. You're number one in my life. You're number one in my finances. So it's a statement of present, but it's also a statement of future. Because when I tithe, I'm saying, God, I'm trusting you to take care of my future. I'm trusting you to so bless that other 90% that I'll be able to live on 90% better than I could live on the 100% if I didn't tithe. So when I tithe, I'm also saying, God, I'm trusting you for the future. See, because tithing is something that requires faith. Because sometimes, I, you know, folks, I know, I've been there. You give to God the 10%, and you say, God, I've given this, but it's, it's faith because I don't know where my next money's, my max paycheck's coming from. I don't know if I can live on the other 90%. I don't know if, if I'm going to be able to pay the other bills, so I'm trusting you. But see, God says, trust me, because tithing is an issue of trust. And actually, tithing is more than an issue of trust. It's actually an issue of test. You know how I said that God tests us with our ability to handle finances? Well, God said, okay, tit for tat, or what do you want to call it? You can test me if you tithe. The only place in the Bible that God gives us permission to test him is with the tithe. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 says, test me in this, says the Lord, O powerful, and I will open the windows of heaven for you and pour out all the blessings that you need. God says, test me. I dare you. Test me. Are you courageous enough to tithe? Test me and see if I don't come through. See, some of you need to make the choice today to go beyond your fear and step out with some courage and put God to the test. Some of you need to commit yourself, your finances to God and begin tithing. And show him you're committed to putting him first in your, in your finances and see if he'll come through. You know, last week uh, I gave the illustration and I took a toonie, right? And I said, who can give me $20? So I'm pretending to be God, remember? It was a stretch, but I took a toonie and I said, I'm God. And I said, T trust me. And I gave, I gave David Two dollars, right? Because it says that God will provide what we need. David gave me back, or I'm sorry, David gave me a toonie. That's right. David gave me a toonie. He tithed, and I gave him twenty dollars back. He still has that twenty dollars, by the way. <laughs> but that's okay, because that's what God does, right? So he he tithed me. I gave him the twenty. You know what happened, David? I sold that twenty in your life. Tuesday, we got a phone call from friends that I made 25, 30, no, 30, 30 years ago. And they phoned us up and said, we hear you're going to the Philippines. Here's $200 to help you go to the Philippines. Two times 10 is 20 times 10 is 200, right? Cool, eh? Because that's God's a giving God. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. On the first day of each week, set aside some of what you've earned to give as an offering. The, the amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. 
right? It's proportional. Tithing is proportional. But God's saying, do it regularly. You're not a tither if you tithe once a year on one income, right? You're a tither if you're consistent, okay? God says, do it regularly, weekly. Now, if you get paid bi-weekly, then you do it bi-weekly. And well, some of you are saying, well, yeah, but I'm going away for a few weeks. What am I going to do? I can't tithe because I'm going away. I'm, we're going to Philippines for a couple of weeks. We can't tithe. Well, that's why we put on our website a link where you can click on that link and you can give electronically. We already, I think we have, what, four or five people in the church now that are giving their tithes electronically now because they can't be here every Sunday because of work, work schedule and everything like that. And that's fine. See, it's a wonderful time to live. We can obey God more than ever these days because we have the, 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 we have the technology. But we also give expecting. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of your income, and he will ter- fill your barns to overflow. He will fill your barns to overflow. So all of us should go home and build a barn, right? No, it was written in 950 B.C. Okay. Today you have bank accounts. You have investments. But God's promise to bless you. You know, in 20, I've been a pastor now for about 25, maybe even more than that, maybe 28 years, because before we planted this church, I was working with homeless men in Peterborough. And before that, I did a number of interim pastorings in northern Ontario with, church, with churches. And I have never, in 25 years that I can think of, I can never remember anyone saying to me, I'm so um, angry, I'm so disappointed in myself that I, learned, that I started tithing. It's the worst decision of my whole life. I've never once, you know that? I've never once heard that in all the years of the pastor. But you know what I do here? Do here? I hear people say over and over again, tithing is the best financial decision I ever made in my life. I can't believe the blessings that have come through in my life since I started to trust God and honor God with my finances. Wow. So that's the principle of tithing. And tithing sustains your savings. How does tithing sustain your savings? Because God puts his blessing on the the 90% you keep. I'd rather have his blessings on 90% or 80% than 70% than no blessing on the 100%. The fifth principle, and this is another principle that helps you sustain your your, your, uh, savings, and it's called enjoying what I have. Enjoying what I have, the principle of contentment. The principle of contentment. Now, this principle is being violated millions of times every hour. <laughs> it, and it's probably our greatest challenge when it comes to finances. Hear me on this. Your greatest challenge in, 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 in saving is not the principle of tithing. Your greatest pr- challenge, really, in your savings principle is this thing about contentment. To me, even people that tithe, they mess up on this one, the principle of contentment. It's our real challenge. Because it's fun to go out and get the latest gadget. It's, it, it's, it's fun to go out and get new clothes, right? It's, you know, every season, new clothes, new, you know, whatever. New spring, time for a new car, time for a new whatever. Um, it's, it's fun to spend money. It really is. But... Part of financial peace is being content with what I have right now. Not meaning that I can't have other things, but I'm content with where I am right now, and I set goals for, for more acquisition, ac- acquisitions. Yeah, I set goals to acquire more, but when I have the money. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 9, it is better that, to be satisfied with what you have than to always be wanting something else, longing for something else. Just dreaming all the time. Wouldn't it be nice if I had this or this or this? Yeah, but I have this, so why don't I use it wisely? Okay. Here, here's the pattern that leads to disaster. I see this pattern over and over again. Number one, I spend more than I make, right? Because my yearnings exceed my earnings. So I spend more than I make. Then number two, I overextend myself financially, and I start going further into debt. And then I have to work harder to make ends meet. So I'm fatiguing, you know, I'm getting worn out. I'm getting stressed out because I'm having to work harder than ever just to, pay, just to, keep my, just to make ends meet. And then number four, my relationships start to deteriorate because suddenly my relationship with my spouse start to deteriorate because suddenly they need something. I, I can't. Can't you see the finances? 
What do you expect? You know, what was the old thing? You can't get about trying to bleed me dry. Or like, there's all sorts of nice ways you can sarcastically say, "I'm stressed out, and there's no money left." So your relationships start to deteriorate. Your spouse, with your kids, with your business partners, with other people. Okay, and it goes over and over and over. And I said, 54% of marriages divorced over the issue of money matters. So what's the key? The key to break the pattern of overspending is called being content. You will never have savings if you do not learn to be content because every time you have no money, no more money, you'll spend it right away. Hebrews 15, or sorry, Hebrews 13 verse 5, be content with what you have. See, we need to realize that ultimately stuff does not satisfy Isaiah 55, verse 2, why do you spend your money and your wages for what does not satisfy? Why do you spend your money and your wages for what does satisfy? See, things do not satisfy. Well, the big question for me was, why don't they satisfy? Like, come on, why don't they satisfy? Why, why, because if I go and buy the latest iPad, the iPad 2, why won't that satisfy me? And the answer is it will for sure a while. But here's the problem. Material things do not change. Material things do not change, but you change. The culture changes. Life changes, but the material things do not change. You know, still, wow. Remember years ago when your parents, if you can remember, your parents said, you know what? If we could only get one of these big old black, typewriters, instead of having to write everything down, if we just get one of those black typewriters, man, and be able to type out all our letters and everything, won't that be incredible? Well, what happened? You changed, culture changed, society changed. How many people are now satisfied with the old black, key, you know, mechanical typewriters? Nobody. See, because things do not change. Things do not change. And that's why they don't satisfy. Even if you buy an iPad 2, you're going to be happy for six months to your maybe. But you know what happens? Next year will come iPad 3. And it'll have more cool stuff on it. And suddenly you won't be satisfied anymore. Remember when you bought your first computer and it had like 16K of memory. Ooh. Or the Commodore 64. 64K of memory. I remember when I went out and I bought a hybrid, my first IBM compatible. It came with a 30 gigabyte, no, 30 megabyte hard drive, 30 megabytes. And I said, you know what? I'm going to get the 40 megabyte. And they're going, are you crazy? You'll never need 40 megabytes ever. The new standard for computers now is 500 gigabytes. Oh, we're going for the Terra. Yeah, that's still, that's this year. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The Terra. The Terra. They're unspecial, yeah. And they'll satisfy for a couple months. See? Because we change. And stuff doesn't change. That's why it ultimately doesn't satisfy. Now, let me, let me just close with this, okay? The root of all financial issues is really an issue of trust and values. Because it's all about what do I really value in life? What do I really trust? Or really, who do I really trust, right? If I put my trust in money and I let my happiness depend on my money, you know what I've really done? This is maybe hard to take, but what I've really done is I've denied God is my God. Job chapter 31, verses 24 to 28, says, if I put my trust in money or my happiness depends on wealth, it would mean that I've denied the God of heaven. Because suddenly all my happiness is dependent on how much money I have, not on my relationship with God. And, And really the reason that some of you are having trouble with savings and the reason that you're having trouble overspending and the reason you're not bringing your tithe to God is because you've got a mismanaged life. You haven't given every part of your life over to God. And you're still trying to manage some of your life yourself. And and, and you need a life manager. And Jesus is volunteering. 
to fulfill that role. You need a leader, someone that's going to guide you in your heart, guide, guide your priorities, guide your plans. And the greatest leader is Jesus Christ. And so I, I want to encourage you today, if that's you, if you're saying, you know what, my life's out of control, my finances are out of control, you need to give that over to the Lord. Maybe you need to give your whole life. If, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you need to give your life to him and let him become your life manager, your savior, your Lord. Maybe you've been living in such a way that your finances, in your finances, you're denying God. Never, you know, you're worshiping, you're praying, you're reading your Bible, but near your finances, you're, in essence, denying God in that area. And, and, and today you need to say, God, I need you to manage my finances too. And, and today, you know what, let's just, let's just close our eyes right now and bow our heads. And I'm gonna, first thing I want to do is, if you're under financial stress, like the, the, we talked a couple weeks ago, finance is a private matter. So we don't need everybody looking at each other and saying, oh, well, this guy's in debt, that guy's in debt. So please do close your eyes and honor what God's trying to do here this morning. But if you are going through financial stress right now, and this is not really for me, but it's so in my private time I can be praying for. If you're in financial stress right now, say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this anymore. Just raise a hand to the Lord. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I want to pray for you first. Father, we're praying, God, like, we're being honest to you today. This, this is a very important moment, Father, because we're being honest to you. And we're saying, God, our finances are out of control. And, and we're realizing that uh, it's stressing us out. And it's stressing our relationships. And so, God, we know you're gracious. We know we're loving you're loving. And God, I, I would pray today for miraculous intervention. God, because simply putting away 50 bucks a week isn't going to do it for me. This is a big issue. This, this is going to take intervention. And God, we do believe in miraculous debt reduction. And we do believe in favor. Because God, you said if we would trust you, that you would make even our enemies to live at peace with us, to give us favor. So Father, today we're agreeing together for favor. Where, where there's great debt, Lord, we pray that you would intervene. It would reduce the small debt. We're praying for intervention, that maybe things that, that we've been struggling with, suddenly the finances would come through, that new job would come through, that promotion would come through, that, that inheritance would come through, that, that, that bank error in our favor would come through. Lord God, we're praying for div just divine intervention. We're praying for the miraculous, and we're also praying for self-discipline that we would trust you during this difficult time and we would give our finances over to you. But God, we pray for peace right now in the hearts of those who are struggling financially and we pray for your intervention because you're a God that loves us and cares about every aspect of our lives. Lord, I also want to pray for those that are ready to commit their finances to you and start living by biblical financial principles. And so, Lord, today I pray, just as I pray this, if, if this is you, just, just in your heart say these same words, uh, God, with your help, I'm going to keep better financial records. God, with your help, I'm going to start planning my spending. God, with your help, I'm going to start saving for the future. So no matter what it looks like economically, I will have my, enough. God, with your help, I'm going to trust you and return the tithe to you. And God, with your help, I'm going to learn how to live with contentment and enjoy what you've already given me. Father, for those that agreed with that prayer, God, I just pray that you would just fill them with your peace and now give them the self-discipline they need in the area of their finances. Number one, to turn their financial stress over to you, that you would give them back peace. And number two, to start working these principles with your help. And God, for those that need it, God, that they'd be humble enough or courageous enough to ask for help. And God, that we'd be able to respond and help them. You know what? And I just want to take a last moment as your eyes are still closed. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never really trusted Jesus with your life, today's a good day again. You need a life manager. That's really what you need, a life manager that will not only save your sins and forgive you from your trespasses, but will start to guide your life 
and give you the discipline you need. If that's you, as your eyes are closed, just raise a hand to the Lord. And I'm just going to pray a closing prayer. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that courage. Yes, thank you. Amen. Last chance, I'm going to pray. Okay, thank you. Put your hands down. Thank you. Father, in Jesus' name, I would just pray for these that raise their hands and say that today you're going to be their life manager. Today they're going to give their lives to Jesus Christ and say something simple like, Jesus, please forgive me of living my own way. Forgive me of all my sins. Today I choose to trust you with my past by forgiving all of my sins and blotting them out with my present for helping me now to walk each day as new unto you and for my future that I'm trusting you that if I do things your way you will provide for all my needs and I'm bound for heaven and Jesus come into my life right now and change me Father help these people that just pray their prayer to truly trust you not only with their finances but also their present and their future and to really feel right now. Yeah, let's just take a moment and do that. Father, right now that you would give them the peace that they would feel your presence right now, that they would feel just the heaviness, the weight starting to lift off of their shoulders as they say, Jesus, today is a day I give management of my life over to you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Mm.